so you know we are doing all this stuff on interrupts and why am i doing interrupts i mean you know this is os stuff and if os people didn't cover it 411 people didn't cover it you know why am i so concerned about it we are going to look at look at uh, non blocking io which has to do with asynchronous and interrupt like communication so if we're going to look at sophisticated process to process communication we should know the relatively less sophisticated device to cpu communication on which the process to process communication depends okay so that's that's the basic thing and also you know you should have a model of the computer before you graduate okay so um, let's let's fill that gap also okay so that's the plan that's the reason and uh, i think i have about 60 animations in this slide so you don't want to think about how long it took me to make this one and i probably got something wrong here because i had to do all the appear and disappear but anyway let's try to understand our computer so our computer must have a cpu must have some memory okay why do we need memory because the process the processes that we run have need memory they need data they need stack and uh, those all are in the processes address space okay and uh, now the memory con contains processes address space plus what kind of uh, i've left something blank here so only part of the memory has to uh, holds the processes address space what else would the memory hold when you guys instruction. buy yeah no, instruction. sorry no, yeah the, the, the instructions also of the processes also are in the address space okay so the instructions the data the stack are all in address space but when you guys buy, buy a new mobile phone, you care about uh, memory for two reasons, right? One, how many apps you load and plus why, what else? Yeah. The operating system. Okay. So, and part of the operating system is the kernel. Part of it is the remaining. So, we'll, we'll talk about that. But for now, we have, we're going to, uh, so we're going to see what's going to go in those gaps and how do the cpu and the uh, how does how do the cpu and memory talk to each other the bus. The bus, right so there is this computer bus it's a broadcast medium and both the cpu and the memory talk through it okay so the cpu needs to access some piece of memory it puts the address in the address bus and either data goes in or it comes out from the data bus okay and we also talk about the control bus okay so let's put the device into the picture okay this is a keyboard and here's your physical keyboard here's the wire going to a port on this on the computer okay. yeah you use the term offhand broadcast medium like what do you mean by broadcast so so what do you think i might mean okay so we have the bus is some wires right so what do you think it broadcast might mean here and right now, right now, actually, I've, since I've got a device here, uh, we can talk about broadcast. Uh, sending a message to another device along the bus. So, so sending a message to another device along the bus could be broadcast. What's the opposite of broadcast? Yeah. Unicast. So what would unicast be and what would broadcast mean? Right. So right now, I'm talking to you guys using... A broadcast medium or a unicast medium? Huh? Broadcast. You guys can all hear. And when you guys ask a question, you know, and, and what do we do? I mean, if two people have to ask a question at the same time, you know, you might start and then he'll back off and then, you know, so that's the problem with broadcast. Okay. So uh, one of the physical mediums on which communication is built is, is it was the Ethernet. And Ethernet used to be a broadcast medium where there was one wire and all the computers and device and other computers are connected to it and now it's become more point to point so you can see there's the alternatives at the physical layer it can be broadcast or unicast okay so just as the hardware can be unicast or, at the hardware level we can have unicast or broadcast at the software level we can decide on broadcast or unicast uh, channels which is what we're going to get into later okay so it's good to kind of know what's going on at the primitive level to understand what to inform what happened at the, at the, at the, more, at the higher level okay more questions Okay, so now here's the device. 
the keyboard and is connected via wire to support. So uh, based on all the discussion you guys had and you might, the material you might have read, so how do the CPU and the devices talk to each other? Through the bus. Through the bus. Okay. And which part is connected to the bus? The keyboard, this point or this point, the port? The port. Okay. So the keyboard is, the port is the representative of the, key, of the device on, on the bus. Okay. And if I want to go and if I, if I go and type the character A here, What's going to happen? Okay, good. So very good. So along, along this wire will go the character and the port will get it. And the port now needs to send it to the CPU. You know, there's also direct memory transfer. Okay. Let's assume it's going to the CPU. And let's assume that the CPU must do some instruction, execute some instruction before it can store it. So it's going to, bro it's going to broadcast that A over the bus. Is that, is that your feeling? I feel it puts it there and then whoever is going to listen to it will know. Whoever's listening will know to go to that part of the bus and take the data. Because the bus is a, a big list of wires. Right. And so it goes to a certain point to take that information. Okay, good. So you're saying the information is not transient, it is stored somewhere. But anybody can go to it if they're looking. Okay, so anybody can go to it if you're looking for it. Yeah, go ahead. So it can generate an interrupt. Okay, so that's something that can be broadcast. But we also have to store the value somewhere according to your own argument. So where would we store the character A? What is the technical term for the area in which the character A will be stored? Device registers. Okay, that's the stuff. Okay, so with each device is a set of is a memory in the device, okay, that holds information relative related to that device, okay, and uh, when we type the type, and, and and so how does information uh, get access to the computer bus, okay, and uh, just as you know, you can uh, get information from main memory through the bus, you can get information from device registers through the bus, okay? And uh, when you type character A in one of the device registers, will the character A be stored, okay? So far so good, okay? Now, how should the CPU now retrieve A? I mean, what should, you know, it's, it's gonna do it through the bus but what kind of instruction should it execute to load A into some part of main memory? It has to execute some instruction, right? And we have some choices. Sorry? Okay. So there are two things it could do. One is it could go, okay, uh, it could so, so store, somehow store that, that's the conceptual thing, right? Or, or basically load the, right? Okay. And how would it name the register? Register? There's a hole in memory. So it has a memory address, but it's actually a hole. Excellent. I like that too. So it's really a memory address. Memory addresses can address main memory. They can also address device registers. So your address space covers more than the main memory. It has to also accommodate device registers. That's, 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 a, that's a decision that's made. You can also have a special instruction that says from device five load memory, in which case we don't have to go and have a regular device address. We can just go and, um, because we just want to somehow name this and it can be device specific naming where you just uh, name the device and, and then some offset in the device. Or you could just assume that all device registers are part of some one big address space. And uh, you could go either way and, and 
Um, I believe, you know, at one time at least they made the decision to go the device address way and I believe they still do, but they are maybe a little dated in my information. Okay. Uh, yeah. How big is the memory for the registers? Depends on the number of registers and how many devices you support, right? So I don't know in which architecture what the numbers are. Okay. But it's got to be enough to store all the, the data of all the devices that are supported. So depending on how many devices you support, okay, if you have only one USB port, you're going to have fewer uh, a, a smaller hole, right? Okay, can I just uh, execute the load instruction in my process address space? From the process, can a process just execute that load instruction through the compiler? I mean, the process can certainly execute a load instruction from main memory, certain parts of the main memory, right? So can it, should it be a can it, I mean, you know, when I say can, if you don't know, just think should. So should any process be able to go and load the current keyboard character into its uh, memory? Okay, just let's get it right, what's read and read and write. The, 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 the A character was written by the device. So I'm asking you actually about the read, read permission. Should any process be able to read a device register and say, hey, here's an address, please give me the data. Sorry? Depends on the privilege settings. So you would allow some processes to read and some not to read. But think about read. But think about it, any process should be able to do a get C, right? Get a character. So, so you would, any, any process that requires characters, you would allow them to read that me memory? It can be helpful, like why not, like someone might have, someone might have a variable to the point uh, of program, like someone could install a program in a computer without your knowledge that could track your key presses. And if it can track your key presses, then it can track your password. Okay, so you, so 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 I have every process should be able to read a character, read the char read characters. And now you're saying you're saying that, but if if any process could read the character directly from device registers, then it could track your keyboard. And what were you going to say? Uh, there would be you you'd eliminate. Basically, the kernel level permission because you just get the kernel password. You would get the kernel password. Yeah, if you typed in the kernel password and anything was allowed to listen to that, that, that uh, user level process would get. And it could then so get there is no kernel password as such, but you're you're saying the same thing. Nirj is saying that you know this is this is uh, this is uh, insecure. This is scary because somebody could be tracking every character that is read. Um, by the way, uh, okay, uh, so what, what's the solution then, yeah? Okay, so there are many questions here. You're saying when processes, there are many processes that, that exist in, in, in the address space and there's rescheduling between them. So you're saying, are the registers saved or not saved? Now remember there are CPU registers and device registers. Okay, certainly we go and play around with the CPU registers. Okay, each process has this independent set of logical CPU registers. The device registers are something associated with the device. Okay, and and you're imagining somehow, you know, that part of the device space is exposed to a process, and then the device space may not be exposed to the process. You're imagining that kind of situation here. Yeah, just the, the data is going to be limited. It should be sort of, I mean, in terms of these software security, right? Suppose the next process is has it access to data from the new process. Would it? I mean, I don't know how it works, but I'm just wondering whether it's cleared. Yeah, so, so these registers, so that's the other thing. When, when do you think the register should be cleared? 
when should a be cleared when another piece of data comes in yeah no no go ahead go ahead when another piece of data comes in so if another piece of data comes in there are two possible possibilities at that point this a might have been read so far or a may not have been read so far if a has not been read so far there's a buffer overflow problem if it has been read then that's good and how will we know it, whether it has been re read or not sorry or uh, maybe a bit there that says whether there is it's cleared or not clear so the, the answer is that this a will be cleared when sorry so i would say that it just cleared a the moment it is read so, so when it is read it is cleared what if multiple processes want to read it now that's the interesting thing at this level we're talking of a regular cpu it doesn't know what a process is okay it knows the cpu and the and and that's it so like if there's four cpus all running okay let's just think of one cpu for a moment okay four cpus are going to complicate matters <laughs> but but we'll generalize that too. Yes. They're sharing this memory. They're sharing the device registers. And each of them wants to know the input from the keyboard. Isn't it better to just not check if something's been written already and just put it there regardless? Just clear, put it, just clear what's there, put a new one in, and don't care if it's already been written. Rather than check if it's written. If it's not written, then oh no, I have a buffer. So you're saying, uh, you know, give no indication to the program that it has been, the input has arrived. It should be more so up to the scheduler when to, like, if it realizes that multiple things are trying to read from the same device, then hold the writing of a new, uh, new key code until all of them have finish their cycle to read. Okay, so that's what you're saying is the character A just got produced and hold off consumption, hold off new production till consumption of it has happened? No, no hold off. So it, it's not, it's probably more so a mechanical, like on the mechanical side of things that the wires would not allow you to overwrite A until the A is already like been like the cycle that A would be being used for is already over. Okay, so until this so has been sort of a sequential problem. Okay, so you're saying hold off new characters till the character has been consumed. Let's just use the word or, consumed. Or it doesn't even have to be consumed, but its current cycle is over. What is a cycle? So the cycle the so like the cycle of a C bringing it back to the CPU. It's the cycle, the CPU is cycling through and it can do so many things with the thread. So you're saying within a cycle, A should be loaded. Yeah. And and if that instruction in the next cycle is not a load, tough. Okay, we just, we just, uh, and if a new character gets input, we just override it and why tell anybody about it? Telling people, the more information you give to the CPU, the better it is, right? So, by the way, what you, you can't hold, you can't stop the user, right? The user can be pounding away. And at the very least, you might want to tell the user, beep, 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 you know, sorry, stop. Okay? <laughs> so, and who's going to do that? Some software. So, if by not giving anybody this information, you're not doing, you know, you're not, you're not being as flexible as you could be. Okay? Yeah. So my issue here is that when someone requests an I.O. they block. So there is no chance that they're going to be able to read until the start of the next cycle. So if they're creating it before the next cycle starts, how are they going to read it? Oh, there's many problems with that. You know about type ahead. That you can be typing ahead, typing away and the process may not even be scheduled. And when it's scheduled, it'll get all the input. So you do have to allow some asynchrony. You can't just assume that the next instruction in the next cycle will be loaded. Okay? So that is why we buffer at least one character here. Okay? And we might need buffering of more characters. That buffering would be done where, you think? 
Do don't computers have buffers? So it's my understanding that the keyboard pushes one character at a time when it's written into an internal buffer that the CPU manages. So the CPU is already allocated an internal memory buffer for the device to store all of the input, so that you don't have the problem of having to check if it's been read or not. So you should push this into just a higher order problem. Okay, so so the CPU, the, the hardware has got one register. So we've got a buffer of one size one, and you're saying you should uh, uh, transfer it to a higher level problem by doing what? Okay, good. So this, the, the, the CPU, uh, the, the computer can create an internal buffer of bigger size in its memory. And would that be in, in the process mapped address space or somewhere else? It is in RAM, but which part of RAM should it be? Kernel, space. kernel address space. The whole idea of an operating system is to mediate among processes. We need mediation here. We've got five processes, all which, which want to read. Who knows which one should get the character? Who knows? The operating system. Okay? What decisions it takes, you know, is the first one who tried it, uh, asked for it probably. Okay? So we need, we need more buffer than that one word. That buffer will be maintained in RAM. Okay? And it's, it's going to hold characters of multiple processes. Okay, two characters might go to one process, two process characters might go to another process. So it can't be in the address space of, space of a particular process. So it will be in some other neutral space, which we'll call the kernel space. Okay, we can call it the operating system space or the kernel space. There's a difference between kernel and operating system, which we'll get into soon. Okay, but that's the idea. Given that, okay, let me I'll let you finish your question. I was just uh, saying, I was just referring to an earlier question you asked where you said uh, where these upper mass are. And they said that what if multiple processes are trying to read something. I was just saying that I have never faced a situation where I'm writing something on a keyboard and I want multiple processes. Control all the link. Oh, you have multiple threads or processes on your computer listening for that? Yeah, but they're listening. They're not taking your input from you. They, 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 they could, like, I'm trying to remember, there is a process, I know, multiple both are using at the same time for control of the reading. Okay, so let's let's not go too far here. Can I write a program that has multiple processes executed at the same time, all of which are doing read loops? So whether you've encountered something or not, an operating system has to go and accommodate that. Right? It may be a bad idea, but you have to allow for that. Okay? So now the question is, should the load instruction be executable by a process directly? No, because it should be done by the kernel. Because we are reading from that buffer. Yeah. The kernel is maintaining that buffer. It's deciding who should get that data. Right? So you're done by the kernel. And what is to prevent, supposing we have this rule, only the kernel should be able to read this particular word and not process. How can we enforce the rule? In hardware, okay, because we're talking of hardware being in a certain, you know, so we want, when the kernel is executing, we want that load instruction to be executed. When the kernel is not executing, we don't want it to be executed. So, Nisha, what were you going to say? Okay. So, it is, it is, does it, does, have you guys heard a technical term for that? Page descriptor tells you which page to go to. But the thing is that the device registers are not paged. But you have to go through the memory instruction to get to them. You could, you could, uh, but but imagine that. You, so you're thinking each device register would be in a separate page? Or is it would be in some bit of memory so it happens to be going using the already built memory access structure? Okay, so let me ask you the recursive question: How do you change the page tables? That's 
And how do you make sure only the kernel can change the page table? You start in the kernel and set it up before bringing the credit. But, but the page tables can be changed dynamically. Yeah. Are you talking about like the hardware rings? Where did you learn hardware rings from? Uh, I mean, the reading and then operating systems. We went over it a little bit. Okay. It's like that's the hardware level permissions. Absolutely. And hardware rings as an extension of a particular concept called mode, processor mode. In processor mode, there's only two modes, user mode and kernel mode. In processor ring, the kernel can be in multiple modes depending on which ring it is. Okay? And typical um, Intel processors have four rings or so. There was a computer called, uh, created for Multics, which has 64 rings. Okay? So Multics is an operating system which did everything big. And Unix then went from Multics to one thing right. Okay? So, so... So we are going to, okay, by the way, let's just get this right. So we're going to have a load instruction. That means our address space is, is uh, I, I, the end should be actually a little below. I'll try to change it before going. But the end should be the end of the box. So we have the, uh, the RAM being 0 to N. And then N plus M uh, is maybe the address of a particular device register area. And N, N plus M plus D1 would be the end of that device area. And then there would be further other devices. Okay, so uh, so that's so we are going to treat it as a, as a memory address. We could even page it, though I don't think it is paged typically. Okay, and uh, we would have an instruction, and the instruction is in green, which means it's not part of the user address space. Okay, and that can go and say load n plus n plus one. Okay, which might be the address in that device register area. Okay. And if I'm to be able to execute that, okay, firstly, I have to know when to execute it. Okay, so you can either use interrupts, like you guys were talking about, which we'll get to later. But interrupts require interrupt handlers, which need to be debugged, which need to output things in order to be debugged. So you should be able to output and interact with the device without interrupts. Okay, so we need a mechanism other than interrupts to figure out whether we have some data or not. And what is the opposite of sort of notification-driven, interrupt-driven computation? Something that, as OS people, you're told not to ever do. Yeah. So asynchronous computation is this interrupt and event-driven thing. Where you're just waiting for an event. Okay? Sorry? Busy loop, polling. Polling. Okay, so the opposite of interrupt-driven computation is polling. And if you didn't have interrupts, you need to poll to know whether there's a new character or not. And how would you poll? What, what information the hardware should give you so that you can poll? That is the ready bit. Okay? So there's a ready flag in the device register saying whether it is ready to have supply you with new data if it's an input device or it's ready to accept new data if it's an output device. Okay? So we've got, we've got the ready, ready information, okay? So we need to go and load it only when the, the device register is ready and we can keep polling for it, okay? And we don't want to do it in user mode. So there is a mode, a, but, a bit, on the CPU, which says, what is your level of access, okay? And, and it, can be, it can be level rather than a bit, okay? And that's when you're going to do rings, okay? And we have to go into kernel mode, somehow magically and in that kernel mode we can execute load n plus m plus one and when we execute that instruction we're going to be to load a we're going to uh, load a and what else will happen to the device registers we clear the bit okay and we then get out of this mode we have a return from uh, to mode and we go to user mode so just a clarification, that is, that is all in main memory, or is it in the bus? All that stuff, all that orange stuff is in the device. This, this, this thing, this stuff is all in the device. Okay. Which can be accessed like main memory through device addresses. And that goes through the bus? Everything is, all communication goes through the bus. Okay. 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 Um, so let's talk of interrupts now, okay? I said that we might not want to work in interrupts mode if I'm 
debugging an interrupt handler, which I literally have. Okay, I was actually writing printf and I had to use kprintf, which is kernel printf, which is a polling printf. Okay, so um, I have to be able to disable interrupts and enable interrupts. So in the device registers, we also not only hold information about the data, whether we are ready or not, but also uh, whether interrupts should be posted with the device or not. Okay. And if uh, the device posts an interrupt, what do you think should happen? Somebody else other than Nirjar? Okay, Nirjar. So the CPU should get notified and the interrupt handler should be executed. Are they two different events or the same event? Same thing. So what does notifying a CPU mean? It has to go and through the computer bus, put a signal saying, I post an interrupt. Okay. Why not make these two one event? Why, why do that? Why say post an interrupt and then execute a handler? Why not just say magically execute the handler? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's more modularized, so you could write different handlers. So you could just like switch out handlers if you ever needed to do something different? So sure, you will have different handlers for different devices. I mean, you can have. You can put the same handler for all devices if you want to. Okay? But why not just automatically execute the handler? Let me get to somebody. Yeah. Uh, I think that's going on. Can we stop at a process that we found uh, going through the handler? So you're saying the kernel should have some control yeah. before it executes the handler? So stop the interrupting threads. Um, the kernel can take action only through the handler. So the handler is the one which will have to do something with the current thread. And what really happens is one of two things. Either the current thread is used to service the thread, service the interrupt, or the kernel thread, the current thread is used to schedule a new thread. But it, 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 the interrupt will always go on top of the current thread, executing thread. It'll just It'll just add to the stack, basically, information. So whatever thread has that stack, owns that stack, is the one that is servicing the interrupt. It sometimes it will stick to switch the uh, kernel process and use that stack instead. So the kernel process will, is, a notion, it will, is so that's what I said. You can do it one of two things. Service the whole interrupt, hand, interrupt in the user thread. Or you can have that user thread execute a handler that goes and switches to the kernel thread to do the handler. Okay. So is that done entirely by hardware? Sorry? Is that done entirely by hardware? So the hardware can do it only if it understands threads. We are assuming a model where the hardware does not provide threads. If the hardware doesn't understand threads, it, it can't go to a particular thread. It has to go to the current stack. Yeah, okay. So In GPUs, you have, you have uh, threads implemented by the operating system, by the hardware, so you can go to a particular thread. So the stack, the regular stack is divided into two parts, the user stack and the kernel part of stack. Okay? But the point is each stack has to be associated with a particular thread. That is the definition of a stack. And unless the hardware knows about threads, it has to use a user thread. And sure, we will go and go into a particular part of the stack, which is the kernel stack, which could, because we want to make sure that we can copy, we can, we can copy from kernel stack to user stack, but not vice versa. So there is some privilege there. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, Nisha. I was going to say, if it lets it go in and do the handler part directly without first informing the kernel, the issue is if there's an interrupt executed, it will just override that interrupt and start executing the new one. Okay, so that's a problem we have to worry about. Yeah, and I was uh, continuing, I was going to say that we don't want that unless the new interrupt is of a higher priority than the overriding. So, um, so
so so we do want to make sure that if we want do want some mediation where what if two different devices post the same in the same time okay in that case it is the hardware that decides which handler gets executed the kernel doesn't decide it okay the kernel the hardware will decide but but certainly we think of them now as two different events that you raise the interrupt and then we the the, the cpu decides which one the cpu decides which one of the handlers will get executed yeah so does the kernel really do anything so let's let's talk about that so we'll 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 talk about that yeah and and so now what if multiple interrupts occur one after the other okay and you're you're in a particular handler and another interrupt occurs okay and 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 oh, what is the danger that's what is the danger there there are many dangers there what's an obvious danger Oh, you don't make any progress with just swapping interrupt handlers. You don't make any progress. You had uh, swapping interrupt handlers. Can you bound the number of interrupts that 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 can get stacked up? So actually, we haven't figured out what happens if I go and type B here before that before that. has been consumed what happens it will post another interrupt okay it will indicate an error that look it got overflow so it will keep posting interrupts so what's the danger if we don't if, if what's the danger about a uh, danger if uh, of cascaded interrupts then you can just stack up like crazy okay so how can you prevent that from happening Oh, what? How does the hardware prevent? Once you take an interrupt, so once you take an dis interrupt, you disable interrupts. So do you disable what interrupt? Not the interrupt of the device. There's another bit in the CPU that decides what what whether interrupts are enabled or not. Actually, it's a number which says what is what is my priority level, and if my priority level is higher than the priority level of the device, then interrupt from that device won't be handled. So now we see why interrupt. raising the interrupt and executing the handler two different actions okay you might raise interrupts but the cpu might say now nah, i'm not executing the handler right now the handler will be executed when next interrupt said interrupt receipt is enabled so there's interrupt sending there's interrupt receipt and each for each device you have a bit saying whether it will send interrupts or not and the cpu goes and says for all devices whether i'm listening to device interrupts or not actually listening to interrupts under a certain level or not but let's just assume there's one bit okay then the data have got lost and we need an indication the data so the data are not lost necessarily so if i am servicing a clock interrupt and i disable interrupts and the keyboard interrupt comes in between we have disable interrupts when the clock interrupt routine finishes we'll go and service the keyboard interrupt as long as another key hasn't been pressed okay so interrupts queued interrupts are not queued oh so interrupts for, for the same device are not queued but yes yes interrupts are queued uh, for multiple devices are queued absolutely absolutely yeah so that one interrupts per device you have only one interrupt per device so there are, there's only one interrupt handler though there's a uh, interrupt you can have a separate interrupt handler for each device the operating system decides for each device what address to put in that for the interrupt handler okay so why would you why don't you just make a ton of interrupt handlers and you never need to queue if you have an interrupt handler for every device ah so why 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 queue something why not just allow multiple interrupts to execute simultaneously as long as they're on different devices and have different handlers yeah have different handlers yeah. guys any idea why not allow multiple interrupt handlers from different devices to execute at the same time so you have to stop one to start the next so you can still have it so before you finish one you start the next one and then you start the next one and then you can you know be stuck starting new handlers and never actually finish anything yeah. well you know you you're just uh, you're just switching among them so you know you go and execute one interrupt handler then you go and execute the next one with on top and then the next one the highest priority one gets executed then it returns then the next higher priority one gets executed returns perhaps yeah it could be like the reason like the same sense of some one has to be queued before the other 
uh, maybe one has to be executed before the other. Uh, sorry? So, so can we handle that with priority? But the priority is given by the hardware, and you, you might want priority to, by the way, as a software. Yeah. I guess I'm, just what I'm confused about is if you have different interrupt handlers, but you can only have one going at a time, what's the point of having different interrupt handlers? So, so why, why have different interrupt handlers? Why have a different interrupt handler for, for, this, for, for an input device and a different input handler for an output device? So there is there's one interrupt handler for the keyboard. Let's say there's one interrupt handler for the network, which often does DMA. But you know, I'm just assuming that we're not doing direct memory answer. Okay, so they just exist separately, but you can only run, run one at a time. Well, you can run multiple at the time, depending on whether you disable interrupts or not. Okay. You can run multiple at a time. It all depends whether you disable interrupts or not. Yeah. So you were going to answer. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, well, I have multiple interrupts, so like if, if I'm the user process and like I divide by zero, I can handle that and then give it a different handler. Um, you can have different handles for different situations. So we'll talk, talk, talk about divide by zero. But yeah, Nisha? I was going to say the same thing. Different handlers for different things. Different handlers for different things. Okay. So they're not just like you have an interrupt handler and then it's, it's they're specific. Five. If you have five USB ports, okay. yeah. maybe you can have the same interrupt handler for them. Yeah, but if you have different types of devices, you need to special ones. Just so modularity. I, I had it in my head as like they're all the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Okay. So whether interrupts execute at the same time or not is, depends on the kernel and depends on whether the inter interrupt is enabled or not. Okay, and we'll get into that a little bit that, you know, you can actually have multiple processors also. And you can have a lot of situations where one interrupt is handled by one thread, another th interrupt is handled by another thread, and then that can lead to contention of common data structures. And if they are shared data structures, you don't want uh, you don't want them to be messed up. Okay. So there's many reasons why you, you want to disable interrupts, and it's up to you, up to the C uh, operating system whether you disable interrupts. Or not. Hardware will go and execute interrupt handlers with abandon. Okay. Okay, so where were we? We have, a, have, have another part of the CPU that says whether interrupts are enabled or not. And like I said, it's normally a number, but we'll just assume it's one or zero. Okay? So now the device says, I want interrupts. We have gone and said that the device should post interrupts. We have, we, we have also set the bit in the CPU saying we will receive an interrupt. Yeah. So one of the questions before we sort of move on from this really basic level that we have is that we we didn't know if, like, when you send an interrupt, you send a bit saying, I'm interrupting, or do you send a, like, a full integer saying, this is who I am, and I'm interrupting? So, you know, the, the place where you say, you know, you, you want information about who's interrupting, right? Because otherwise you don't know what interrupt handler to execute. So the, so the CPU has to know who was interrupting. So if the wire goes to a particular point, which is associated with a particular device, then the fact that that flag got, that signal got raised, means that we know who's executing. So it sends the number of interrupts from the table, is that? Somehow, by magic, when it says there is, it raises its interrupt level, the CPU knows which device it is. Whether it sends its own number to a common place or whether it sends a single bit to a, to a dedicated place, you know, let's just leave that aside right now. Oh, I was saying how much information is conveyed. Yeah. How much information is conveyed by a bit going, going oh. <laughs> uh, just the fact that that device, so you're saying a device getting interrupted is one bit and that device getting interrupted, uh, getting, uh, getting uh, interrupted is more than one bit. I should say, how much information does it s send about a particular device? So I'll rephrase that question. So about that particular device, how much information was sent? Just the one bit. The one bit. It's not that it went and posted the character A on it. Okay, that has to be retrieved through the device register. No, but it could have posted the character A, but it didn't have to 
host it is uh, so like if let's let's say the keyboard is interrupting and let's say the keyboard interrupt in an interrupt description table is interrupt number hundreds. So can't it go and say that okay, so my offset in the interrupt descriptor table is hundred and my interrupt will convey that offset. Yeah, so the interrupt is conveying that it is interrupting. Yeah. I, I don't care how it's doing that. So my question is I can create an interrupt description interrupt which can do that using one bit. I can also create an interrupt Let me clarify again. The question is saying how much information about a particular device is sent when an interrupt about the device happens. How many bits of information does an interrupt give to its interrupt handler? Sorry? The question is how many bits of information does an interrupt give to its interrupt handler? How many bits of information does it give to the interrupt handler? I mean, I would say eight because there's two fifty-six interrupts and it leaves. Oh, to a particular interrupt handler. Yeah, it's just the one to the interrupt tells the if the hand tells the Handler right. To a handler. Okay. So. I had another question before we move on. Okay. Every time we load, if we're going down to the kernel level and then doing an up call, won't that slow things down significantly? <laughs> so, won't things get slowed down indeed? Okay. And that is why design of operating system API in general and IPC API in particular has to be very sensitive to this. Okay. And there are many choices that, that get made based on efficiency. Okay? Indeed. Yeah, okay. Instead of getting one character at a time, you get a, you know, a bunch of characters that then process all those because then you only have to do the one call with the kernel as opposed to then it goes into everything that turns versus back and forth every time for each character. Indeed. So we, we, we want to make sure that we make, we make few get C calls. And we don't make a get C call for each character. And that's why we have an internal buffer in the kernel that goes, does that. Okay. okay. Good. So I'm glad that the amount of time we are spending on this is somewhat proportional to the amount of time I spent on this slide. <laughs> so, okay. And we still don't know the slide is correct or not. There were so many things I did here that I could have easily messed up. Okay, I tried to go and look at it multiple, multiple times. And I have got the N a little too high. I have to lower the N to just above N plus M. Okay. So we're receiving, we re so now let's say the, the uh, uh, device has said, uh, the, the, the device send interrupt bit is on. The processor receive interrupt bit is on. And now I go in and we, we have interrupt handlers we, we've seen. Okay, I don't know why it says two here. And uh, now the user types B. Tell me what's going to happen. All the things that are going to happen in sequence ideally. Yeah, the state is right there in front of you. Okay, so one thing, one thing at a time. A is going to get replaced by B. One action. What else? The ready goes from zero to one. What else? You Sorry. You will uh, you will reset the interrupt. You'll, the, you'll, uh, raise an interrupt from the keyboard. Okay, the keyboard will raise an interrupt. Good, good, good. Excellent. Next. So the CPU in this case will decide whether to execute the interrupt handler or not. And we know that we are saying receive interrupts one. Yeah. So it will execute the interrupt handler. Is that one the previous one or is that the current interrupt handler? If that's the previous no, one. No, no, no. This is the, the we, we didn't have interrupt before. We did the, we, we would, we, we had interrupts disabled at that point. Oh, okay. So yeah, it will uh, execute the interrupt. It will execute the interrupt handler. Anything it will do before executing the interrupt handler? Yeah. It has to go to kernel mode. Okay, we got it all. See whether I got it all or not. B, one, kernel mode, interrupt handler. Okay? And interrupt handler has some choices to make. And what is one choice that we've talked about that it can make at this point? Does it start a new thread or does it work on top of the new thread? Okay, does it start a new thread or start, but at the heart or just use the same thread? 
and at the hardware level, what decision has does it have to make? Whether it should go and receive ch changes bit from one to zero, okay, it'll probably change it to zero, okay, and then at some point, and at this point, it can go and execute an instruction like load n plus m, and now we see why, how this green instruction got executed. We went into kernel kernel mode. It went into automatically. Whenever interrupt handler is called, it goes into kernel mode automatically, and it stays in kernel mode till you get a return from interrupt instruction. So before it does return to interrupt, it goes and executes load n plus m plus one. It's relative to the CPU. There's no process here at this point. So it's loading it. Where is it loading it? I mean, what is it? It's loading it in some part of memory, which will be in what what memory did we call that? Kernel memory. Okay. It loaded it. The bit became zero. Right. And what happened here? Once it started, it changes to one. Sorry? Once the interrupt is done, it changes the, uh, the receive interrupt to one. One. It back into right. Back. It enables interrupts, returns from that, returns from this, goes to user mode. But uh, I had a like, conflicting question here. Like, so I know that some things like, let's say, page port handler. You can execute that in user mode through upwards. What so handler? That mode, page port handler, let's say. Yeah. So I know you can execute that in user mode via an upcall. So my question is, how exactly would that work? You can execute it in user mode via an upcall. Yes. What does that mean? That means that you should, like. That the, the, page, the page handler is going to access the page tables. Mm -hmm. Unless you have rings. If you, uh, you, if you allow that in user mode, then any user can go and change the page table automatics directly. Right? So it is the case that with rings, certain th th things get done, certain um, modes are more powerful than others. Okay? But without rings, then it, it, there's no safety. Okay? So it won't go to kernel mode for all ARPs. It needs to set up the Okay, let's get to divide by zero for a minute soon. But if we allow interrupt handlers to be in user mode, then any instruction can go and change that code, can go muck around with it. So interrupt handlers are done in kernel mode. Divide by zero, let's get to that soon. Okay, let's get to that's not an interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. So how does the process get the data structure from kernel safe space? Right, right, right. So how does it get to user space? How does it get to That's a good question. And let's go and deal with the interrupt with trap also. Okay. Okay. So what happened here? Okay. So what if you had not been able to what if you had not been able to read the keyboard input before the next keyboard input came around? There's also a, 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 this is what I just showed. I/O data and zero came up. That there is a part of the device register which said whether there is a error occurred or not, whether there's a buffer overflow problem there or not. So that is something you can access to figure out if there was an overflow or not. Okay. And you can have multiple devices. So you can have a real-time clock. What does a real-time clock do, by the way? It's also an interruptible device. It's got device registers too, but most important, it's an interruptible device. It'll interrupt when. Some time passes periodically. So this time of day clock and this real time clock. The real time clock interrupts every so many units of time. What do you think time of day clock would do? Yeah. 
So, so hang on. Why do we want real-time clock? Why do we want to be interrupted every time unit or so time unit? So the CPU? So we want to give each process some time quantum. We have to have a notion of time. And time is important in general, right? People might ask you what time it is in the computer. So, but yes, from a scheduling point of view, we want to make sure how much time has elapsed. And we can also keep the time of day. But the time of day clock would do for what for us then? It would just store the time. It would just store the time of day which we can pull, keep polling. Okay. So there is there is a CPU clock. Remember, there is a CPU clock that decides the clock cycles. Okay. That is not interrupting you after each cycle. That is just executing the next instruction. So there is a CPU clock. There is a real time clock which interrupts as a device. And there is a time of day clock that CPU might or might not have. What do you think? What do you think? Which one will the scheduler use to change the processes? Yeah, that's what he said, right? That was that's how he motivated the real-time clock to make sure that it's not the CPU clock, because that is not interrupting you every after every cycle. Those cycles go very fast. Okay. Questions? Okay. And now that we have multiple devices, it, all this stuff of having multiple interrupt levels makes sense, right? Because now we want to give, we want to give clock more uh, higher priority or the keyboard higher priority? Okay. Clock is a, yeah. Which, which device should, what, is, what does the real time clock do? Somebody who just said, what does it do? So it is used as a scheduler to make sure that a particular thread doesn't take too long. So it has to have the understanding of time. So it goes and interrupts every so many units of time. And by counting how many times it's interrupted, I can keep track of time. Right? Okay. And so why did you say the clock should be given higher priority? So one one reason is that you know fairness is more important than functionality in some sense. You're saying, and also if one device is faster than the other device, which should be given higher priority? The slow one can you know the faster one is going to come again and again. So let's go and service it. The slow one can wait, right? But we'll give the real time clock higher priority than the network device because time is more important. Okay, assuming that the interrupt de network device interrupts every time. The network device will buffer a lot of stuff and just then interrupt or put it into DMA. So, is there anything which is more important than the so you know, this is this becomes a political question, okay? And 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 uh, it depends on the system, but uh, you would imagine that the real time clock is the highest priority, okay? So we can have more than one interrupt handler. So this uh, the reason why there was both twos was because I copied and pasted. So I should go and make the f top one one. And so we have another, we have a clock, so we have a separate interrupt handler for that. And the clock interrupt handler will do very different things than the input, int input, input hand interrupt handler and the output interrupt handler. Okay, that's what we want for modularity, different handlers. Okay. Finally, divide by zero. So here I am in the process and I do divide by zero. What is your model of what happens? <laughs> everything works. What all have to happen to, to make everything work? A lot of things have to happen, right? To make something not work, you can do whatever you feel like. There are many ways to destroy. There are so few ways to make and construct. So, uh, what will happen when you do eleven by zero? Trap into the kernel space. The kernel space would find the current running process, whatever is scheduled, and it would 
kill it? Won't you say some message saying divide by zero? So the trap handler will execute and the process will die. Have you ever programmed in Java? Yeah, my process in a, is dying. In a civilized language, what happens? The program is given a chance to handle that. Yeah. And an exception handler will execute. Yeah, so you know, let's, you know, let's not kill too prematurely here. <laughs> yeah. Let's not use two different terms for the same concept. Trap handler is a nice term. Yeah. But let's say it uses the trap handler and the trap handler will look at the registers of that process. It will find out the line that was currently executing in the RSP. And uh, once it finds the line, it will throw an uh, exception uh, saying that this line was divided by zero. And then it would change the RSP to the What point, is RSP? The stack pointer. Okay. The stack pointer. What, what is RS, RSP? Uh, what is R there? Uh, I, I don't know exactly the uh, translation for R because I know that for 64 bit you use RSP, for 32 bit you use ESP. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Sorry? It's just x86 bit. Oh, okay. So let's, 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 you know, I've tried very my best to be abstract here. So let's just say stack point. Okay. And let's say the stack point to the place where the program can save. Okay. So, so, in all of these cases, stack is involved. With the interrupt handler, also a stack was involved. Okay, and you 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 execute the method just as any procedure call. There's a stack involved. Okay, so what what you said was just just fine. That you go into kernel mode, you execute a trap handler now. Okay, in kernel space. Okay, you're going into kernel mode, and that goes and executes and does whatever it feels like. Okay, it can do all these nice things, or it can just say code dump. Okay. So that depends on uh, what the handler does. Okay. Okay. If getting there somewhere. Now let's go and say the process says, "Give me a character." Your question you were trying to answer. Okay, and the character is somewhere stored in some kernel space. And how do I get that character? I'm in user space. I want the character. I'm making a system call. You go to kernel mode. You go to kernel mode. How do you go to kernel mode? Very good. We need to go to kernel mode somehow. That, by definition, the data structure is in kernel space. We have to go to kernel mode. And just and, and I mean that's a perfectly good answer. But what's the detail of what really happens? Okay, so you're saying you're saying it. Go, you're saying what what was what he said. You're not saying anything different, right? He said it goes into kernel mode. You're saying it goes into kernel mode, right? And um, how does the how does it know to execute which part of the kernel? You know, the get character should be. You could do execute kernel get character. You could execute put character. How does the kernel know which one to execute? Okay. So, uh, anybody want to use uh, a more technical language that you might be, be used already? So, we are going to execute a trap instruction. Okay. So, trap handlers get executed in response to errors occurring, or we can explicitly execute an instruction that says trap. And that instruction takes as an argument some number, some information. Okay? And when that, that means if it's a trap, it must have a trap handler associated with it. Okay? So we have a trap handler executed with this trap instruction. And this trap handler is going to look at that argument and figure out whether it is 7 or 5 or 3. And depending on that, it's going to go and execute some code in the kernel that says get C or put C and so forth. Okay? And it'll go and get the value and it'll copy it into user stack. From kernel stack, you can copy it into the user part of the stack and you'll get back to that. Okay? Is, is it always just a single character or do you give block between Yeah, yeah, you can, you, can, you can have multiple, I mean, I'm just assuming one character you can have in general an array. 
Right? Sorry? Yeah, 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 yeah. It'll give it a yes, absolutely. It'll give it it'll give it a whole string. Absolutely. We don't want that to be of just a character. Excellent. Okay. So uh, we execute get C. Get C will call trap. That will result in kernel mode. That will execute a trap handler, which can do whatever it feels like. Okay? It can do, and now it goes and calls. So that get C that we had earlier was just a stub. It doesn't do anything but trap. The real work is done by some kernel routine, which we'll call in this case TTY get C. And TTY get C will actually retrieve the data and return it back to get C. Okay? So TTY get C is called, it returns, and uh, the trap handler returns, uh, and the trap instruction and get C also return. I got them in the wrong order, but they both return. Okay? And we go back to user mode. Okay? Now you guys see why I had like 60 or 70 animations? And I, the thing was that I didn't just come up with a smooth lecture. Okay, I came up with the first and the last part. I said, no, let's go insert this also in between. Let's go insert this between. That's why it got all jumbled up, you know, my kernels. So it, it took forever. But uh, Okay. So I said a lot of things. And uh, uh, hopefully the transcript has captured all of them if you want to ever search for them. But I've got things in text here too uh, so that you can answer your questions better. So we have a computer bus. Okay, which is a centralized broadcast communication uh, architecture instead of peer-to-peer. -peer. And uh, what are the components of a bus? What, how can we divide the bus into parts? We, I talked about it earlier. Let's just go and revise that. Port. Sorry? Port. Port, uh, port is, corresponds to a device. The bus is more general. It allows CPU, memory, and devices to talk to each other. And what kind of talking is done here? What kind of Information flows on, along the bus. So the information is broadcast. True. So it could be unicast or broadcast. And then what kind of information? Can you classify the information into multiple categories? Bits. Sorry? It's, just bits. it's bits. That's general. Current. Sorry? Current. Yeah. Electrical current. Electrical current. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. registers. So registers. Uh, the registers, there's memory. And this, so, <laughs> you know, the hallmark of a good teacher is to extract the answer from you guys. I'm failing badly here. <laughs> so you can pass, you can send data. What else can you have sent, uh, signal sent along the bus? Interrupts, that's control. And data are fetched from or stored at? Ah, thank you. <laughs> Somehow I got it. <laughs> okay, so this address bus, if you look at Wikipedia, it'll say there's three components, address bus, data bus, and control bus. Okay, so the addresses go along some lines, data go along other lines, okay, and control information goes along different lines. Okay, so yes, information is broadcast, but these three kinds of information are kept separate. Yeah. That all of them together make up the computer bus, the bus. Okay. Okay. And the control bus, from our point of view, you know, posting interrupts is done in the control bus. There's also other information. Yeah. Now, when it says lines carrying addresses, is that not data too, or like what is carrying addresses? The way the circuits are made, and I'm actually I'm a double E who actually came to computer science by making one of these things and saying, oh, this is cool. Let me go and understand the layers above too. So, you know, where the addresses go to different parts parts of the chip. And the data come out from different parts of the chip. Okay. So they're just separate lines. Okay. Yes, okay. overall you can think of them as data as a computer scientist, as a mathematician, they're all data. Okay. okay. But addresses go to certain places that trigger data coming out. Okay. okay. Questions? Device registers, what kind of content do they have? If, how, how will you type the information in a device register? <laughs> just data. You're too much of a C programmer. So what kind of information do we have if you have to classify the data into categories? Sorry? 
I, this is revision. I'm not introducing new concepts. I'm trying to revise what we saw in the picture. Okay. Ready bit. Go. Oh, good. 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 Ready bit. What else? Interrupt bit. What else? Error. Good. And data. Okay. Okay. And how do we address device registers? No special instructions. Okay. You could go with that architecture too. But we just use device addresses. And uh, uh, this is just mundane information. Okay. Okay. So, uh, interrupts. So, what kind of information does an interrupt event convey? Who I am and whether I'm interrupting or not. So, uh, yeah, whether I'm interrupting or not. When, when would you interrupt though? I mean, what, 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 what triggers? Suppose in your input device you interrupt when? And when you're an output device, you'll interrupt when? When you're ready for new output. When you just finish the finish last output. One question arises. I finished the last output. I interrupted. There was nothing to do. Now, somebody has said put C. And the put C can only be serviced by an interrupt routine. So how do I trigger, how, how does the program, uh, CPU trigger interrupt? when when you're starting a new sequence of characters so if you're if you're printing hello world after h e l l o, o you, you interrupt gets posted and the next character gets consumed but you said hello you waited a while now you say world and you you say w how do i force an interrupt at that point okay sorry so maybe there's nowadays there's an instruction was turning off interrupts it used to be that if interrupts were disabled and you enabled them, an output device automatically posted an interrupt. Okay, because you will disable interrupts after after all the characters have been output, you just disable, and then you would enable. Okay. Um, device control over interrupts. Each device has an interrupt enable bit. We saw that. CPU control. The CPU has registered to decide if it reacts to posted interrupts or not. Okay. And we said it's raising the processor priority. And here's the, here's, here's, I'll take a couple of minutes uh, for this slide. So how does an interrupt really get serviced? Interrupt is an alternative to polling, right? But I'm, but I'm arguing here that interrupt is also polling. Did you guys study this in architecture? After each cycle, the CPU checks if there's an interrupt, but which is on or not. It's polling. It's just doing it at a much lower level, okay? Rather than requiring you to do that in a web browser or some other level layer, it's just and making a system call perhaps to do it. It's after every cycle. That's called cycle stealing, okay? And then we've seen it goes into kernel mode. And we've talked about time of day clock versus real time clock. This summarizes that information, so I won't go through it. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll stop at this point and I thought this would be 15 minutes and I'll help you guys with your, with your questions. So this was more than 15 minutes. Uh, we'll carry on on Thursday and what I'll do with the quiz is uh, uh, make, it, make it due perhaps on Tuesday. But I might also post a new quiz in the meantime and we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about, um, uh, let me just go here. Uh, this is the stuff I want to spend some time on because it has to do with atomicity and this is tricky stuff. Uh, but here's the deal. You know, the, the assignment, you guys can do it without knowing all the theory. But it will be smoother when you know all the theory. You also have options to do extra credit. So I'm going to sit down and uh, post new assignments. And I'm going to just make you guys go on one of two tracks. Either you're going on the extra credit track, in which case I'll recommend certain dates by which you should finish assignment one so that you can do extra credit assignments also. And if you really want, you know, to do it in a proper way, then just, you know, do the extra credits later if you can, but then just wait to, to, to use, do all the theory uh, through quizzes before you start the assignments. But I would recommend jumping into assignments, seeing where you get stopped. I believe I've written, you, written most of the details you need in the assignment itself. You can do it. You may not understand it completely, but you, between the quiz and the assignments, you will understand everything at some point. So I'll work on that. 
Um, like I said, I didn't, I'm very glad there were all these questions, but it just, uh, you know, uh, we need some more time. And, and so I, I'll, I'll uh, um, so like I said, I'll postpone the quiz day perhaps to, uh, we'll see, perhaps next Tuesday. Okay? Yeah. Okay, good. So let's, let's, let's look, look uh, further at what we were discussing last time. So we discussed that how, you know, data are transferred through device registers uh, uh, to the CPU, okay, uh, and then to memory. So what about network and disk? Do we want to actually interrupt on each byte received? So what do we do instead? Sorry? Packets arrive on the network, but how do we transfer it to, um, you know, how do we process them? So we, we buffer the packets, uh, uh, buffer the packets, and maybe we don't have enough space in our device registers to buffer the packets. So what else can the device do? You might have heard this buzzword. It's it's a three-letter buzzword. It starts with a D. DMA. No. Can can you guess what the DMA might mean? Okay. So you can, you can, even in the old, old computers, the disk would go and, you know, take a whole sector and just copy it directly to memory and then it'll interrupt after that copy has been done. Okay. And, and, and the network card will go and buffer a lot and transfer. Okay. So, um, so that's DMA or direct memory access. Okay. Now here's something that was confusing me a lot. And uh, I don't think this is described in any textbook that I, that I know about or Montec knows about. So I had a bunch of exchanges with Montec. I looked up the web. So, um, so you know, we, we talked about the fact that, you know, where are the device registers stored? Are they stored on the device, on the keyboard itself, or are they stored on the port? And we said they're stored on the port because the port is the one that's connected to the bus. But how does USB work then? I mean, USB is this generic port to which you can connect heterogeneous devices. And people like Andrew might know the answer better than I do. So uh, how do we, I mean, are the registers stored with this USB port? And if so, you know, different devices can have different registers. So what's going on there? I think that it's there. It's not actually the direction the message directly there is out. So everything has done. ID on the network, so it's a whole separate uh, network layer in there. So you say, so yeah, I want to talk to the device, you know, three, then everything back and forth through that instead of... Right, so, so that's, that's the point, that the same port can be used to connect to multiple devices. And maybe the devices identify themselves in some way. But where are the, where is, where are the data stored, actually? I mean, what, where, where are, the, are there any device registers? And if there are, where are they? So, you know, you could have many, many answers here. One is that you could just have a union of all possible registers and have everybody conform to that. I don't think that really happens. You can assume that these devices only talk via DMA. So they, are, they don't use device registers and they go always and save it in some part of memory that and, and, and how much memory is used depends on the device. But what I'm getting through some, some, some searching I did was that... Um, there is a notion of interrupt and, and there's a notion of getting data from the device. So I have to believe that when you connect the device to that bus, there's some proxy in, in the wire you're using to connect that has the device registers at the end end. That is my best guess. Okay, I, somewhere in that cable is the memory to store, store the registers. Okay, um, and as you were kind of hinting, there is kind of a network like protocol based on packets that is used to transfer between that storage and, and the system bus. So there's this protocol, which is, and, I, and there's actually, I looked, I found an article which describes some of the details of the protocol. But I just wanted to sort of, for completeness sake, it's not ever, ever going to be complete. For more completeness, I wanted to just address this issue too. Okay? Okay. Uh, what happens to multiprocessors? So we, we saw that every device has a bit that says whether it should send interrupts or not. 
And we also saw that the processor um, has its own priority, which basically decides whether it's going to receive interrupts or not. So, and it can enable, disable, interrupt receipt by changing that priority. So, what happens in a multiprocessor when a CPU disables receipt of interrupts? I mean, what are some options? Yeah. So you're you you so there are two options possible. One is that interrupts are disabled for everybody, or only for that processor. Did you? I was just going to say, just, just don't don't listen. I would say on all CPUs. So that is what you would say. But don't listen. Uh, not not to say to stop sending these. Stuff yeah 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 things. yeah. No, this is, has to do with listening. Stopping. Yeah. So that's what you would do, and that that that, that and but you know uh, so. <laughs> Which way do you think people go? They're both possibilities. Now remember, this particular bit is stored in a, in a register. Each CPU has its own register. So this is very CPU specific, just from that point of view. Okay. So, um, but why did you think you should disable all interrupts? Well, I, I, would, I was under the assumption that for a given interrupt, only one CPU is handling it. So the one bit in that CPU is sufficient to disable Right, 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 right. But is there any... Intuition as to if, if multiple CPUs could handle interrupts, um, is there some logic for disabling all interrupts? Okay, we'll get to that soon. So you're saying the interrupts might conflict. If you're handling, if, let's say that there's four products, four processors, processors and Three interrupts come up, and the first processor takes the interrupt and disables other interrupts. The second one does it, the third one does it. If two of the interrupts are somewhat related, even though they're from separate devices, but the devices communicate with each other and rely on each other, if both of them are processing interrupts, then something could, like, something bad could happen. Not, yeah, something bad could happen. Excellent. That is the correct answer, even though we, that's not what it does. But that's a concern you have to have, that two interrupt handlers are executing simultaneously. And what bad things can happen when two pieces of code execute simultaneously? So race conditions, corruption. Okay? So that's the danger. And remember that they are accessing data structures in the kernel. Okay? Like scheduling table. Right? Who's going to run next? Imagine the two interrupt handlers making independent decisions and one person is just about to move the pointer whereas the other person, the other guy is reading the pointer and you know, if you ever done, dealt with concurrency, you know bad, what bad things can happen. Okay? So we have to deal with that problem given that we took Nirja's solution and not your solution. I'll gradually learn, learn all your names since we have small enough class. But <laughs> Okay. Uh, each processor has a separate register indicating interrupt receipt, indicating whether interrupt receipt is enabled. That is its priority. So now the question is, you know, if, if so let me, what's, what's your name? Robert. R Robert? Yeah. Robert, okay. That's an easy one to remember. So, uh, you know, Robert asked the question, uh, you know, what is the assumption? If there is an interrupt and multiple processors have it enabled, what are the set of choices one can imagine? And one choice you thought was? On well, I would just, I mean, I would have all of them go to CPU 0 and CPU 0 deal them out, but then excluding CPU 0, so all certain interrupts. Only. So you're saying somehow we decide that a particular, only a single processor will handle interrupts? Well, depending on the interrupt. Oh, depending on the interrupt. Yeah, yeah. So a clock interrupt could be handled by one and, and so, oh, that's, that's, okay, I didn't even consider that choice, but that's, that's a choice too that we divide different interrupts among different processors. Yeah. Okay? Okay, I should, I should add that. Okay? Uh, that's one choice. Any other choice? Especially, yeah. So, so, if, if uh, somebody is else is handling an interrupt, 
let's go and have the interrupt service as quickly as possible. So let's find the CPU, uh, let's find the ACPU that is not handling an interrupt and handle that. And then we have to worry about that bad things happening. Okay, but that's an excellent choice too. Again, not in my list. This is why this is why asking questions is great. I'm not I'm not trying to learn, not teach you guys. Okay. Uh, Okay, so Nirchar likes the fact that only one, only one process should be handling a particular form of uh, interacting with an I/O. So you're saying you've never seen programs that take two input from two different processes that take input from two different keyboards, even though we can write those programs. Remember that. Okay, so the operating system, uh, the kernel. You're saying, uh, and, and, and what would you gain by doing that? Uh, if that program is probably blocked on reading, so it's probably not even running. Yeah. So what did you gain? So you think the response time will be better? But remember this process that once input is blocked, any processor, you know, and, and, and so interrupt on any processor can unblock it. Okay. But so, but if another processor unlocks it, won't we? Um, because if I'm not wrong, the state of the processor when it gets blocked is stored in the kernel stack, right? Sure. So, so state of the process or the thread. Yeah. So, if I'm going to a different uh, different CPU, don't each CPU doesn't every CPU have a different kernel stack? The CPU a thread has a stack. Okay. No, no, no. See, where is the stack stored? I mean, it's stored in memory. Okay. So now you're going to you're going to the kernel mode. Mm -hmm. And and this any stack is portion of the main memory. Mm -hmm. And kernel stack is just portion of the main memory in kernel memory. Mm -hmm. So it's specific to it'll be allocated for each okay. thread. Okay. So and 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 uh, you know one of the things you have to worry about is cache. So what is cached? As long, you know, and you might say that you know, we want to schedule the block thread on the same CPU it was when it blocked. That's fine. The interrupt handler just has to unblock it. The interrupt handler can be on any processor. All we have to make sure is that that particular thread goes to that process. Okay. Yeah. Could it be like a hierarchy of CPUs, like one that's So you're saying some interrupts are closer to some CPUs? I don't know whether that could, that could be a possibility. See, this is imagination going, yeah. Or the simple solution that only one of the processors will do all the interrupts. Okay, so simple solution that only one processor will do all the interrupts. That, that takes care of your problem of conflicting things happening. And then who makes the decision, the hardware or the operating system? I mean, we could have a CPUs. So who makes the decision, the hardware or the? The OS. Okay, or the hardware could do it also. There are some architectures. It depends on like how it's configured. Like not every computer or machine is going to be the same. Uh, sure. So, so historically, we just have to see what decisions have been made by people. We can let our creative minds uh, go, or we can just see what people have done. Okay. So, uh, what people have done is a computer decided by the hardware, a computer designated by the OS. Okay, and you decide this is the particular thing. The first computer that pulls the interrupt. Remember, how do you find that interrupt? The CPU pulls and checks the bits. So the first one that pulls finds that, does that. Okay. So, and all the choices that you guys had, that all possibilities, but these are the ones I believe uh, that have actually been implemented. Yeah, there's a lot of the Intel press that probably said they stick to the algorithm. They, they have a, a mix. So a, there are some interrupts that only go to CPU zero. Okay. There's a, like several layers of interrupt controllers. So and maybe the 8th only go to processor zero, and then the larger buses go to the other ones as well. Okay, so that's consistent with what you guys were saying. Some, some interrupt, based on the device, we choose the processor. Okay, so apparently that's that's done. And do you know the details of which interrupt? I can't remember exactly. That's the legacy stuff. You know, way back when, that's how it went, man, or I'm going to go through the and when somebody as young as you says way back, I don't, this is what happened. I don't know what's happening now. Think of me. <laughs>
So that's why it's better to think of the possibilities than to actually see what is done. Because here we can really think, think things out. Okay. So in most classes I teach, I try to imagine how I would have designed the system. Like you guys, I don't read the manual. So I just try to figure out how I would have done it. And uh, so sometimes this is what you have to resort to. Okay. So dot, dot, dot. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the solutions too. Okay. So now let's talk about bad things that can happen. Okay. So kernel code can potentially can kernel code potentially be executed by multiple threads, and we you know the obvious answer is that if you've got multiple CPUs, yes, two CPUs can both make system calls, and execute kernel code at the same time. Okay, and we just talked about the dangers of doing so. Okay, so they both may be accessing the same data structure. So um, what if we have only one processor? Can kernel code be executed by, multi, by multiple threads at the same time? That means we are in between finishing some routine in the kernel. Yeah. How, how would that happen? So I make a get C call. Okay. Before my get C call finishes, some other thread also enters the kernel to make perhaps another get C call or make a notify call or a wait call. So how might that happen? Yeah. I think it'd be taking too long to get Okay, excellent. So here I am doing GetC, and GetC is written by somebody, you know, somebody who's got access to the open source Linux and has really screwed up and is making taking it to take, making it execute too long. And how would it get rescheduled, by the way? What 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 event will trigger this rescheduling? So the clock interrupts, and and we figured out that it's taken too long, so we schedule another process thread, and that goes and executes GetC. Excellent. Yeah. It could also get interrupted by a higher priority process. So here we are executing the interrupt. Excellent again. Um, that interrupt hand, this is, this is executing and suddenly, and we are in the kernel, and an interrupt occurs. Not even higher priority, just an interrupt occurs. Okay. Now that will probably use the same stack as this, 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 as, as, as this particular thread. But then we can imagine interrupts occurring from two different devices. And, and, and so, uh, that can cause that cause this to happen also. Okay. So a rescheduling can happen because the time passed. The rescheduling can happen also because something blocked. So uh, or some or something was was unblocked. So in my get C, I go and notify some notify some other thread. And suddenly that thread gets unlocked. Okay, so I'm willingly giving, or there's even some routines that go and say resume, and they resume a particular thread. So I could call that method in my get, in my uh, system call, and I could go and uh, uh, start another thread. Okay. So does resume mean that I will force it to be run again, or will it just move it to the ready queue? It will move it to the ready queue, but what if it is the highest priority thread? And what typically happens is that when you call reschedule, when you enter the kernel ever, it says, aha, got you. You're in the kernel. Regardless how much time you've, that's passed, let's reschedule you. Because you'll, time will probably pass again and we don't want you to make another kernel call. So, you know, you're being nice, you notify somebody and you get rescheduled. Okay. In fact, some operating systems don't even reschedule on time or interrupts. They say, you know, programs will, will, will enter the kernel and at that point we'll just reschedule. Okay, so a threat even that is because users get care, a threat even that is scheduled in the middle of get care, okay, either by uh, by interrupt or by by some notify method occurring, uh, being called. Okay, so now we have to figure out how to prevent these threats from executing concurrently, because they may be if if if. We are accessing the same data structure that must be accessed atomically, that is shared and must be handled accessed atomically. Maybe some data structures are only specific to a particular interrupt. Okay? And then we don't have to worry about you know, that kernel data structure being accessed by other threads. Okay? But in general, there might be some data structure like the scheduling table, like a page table, that you're in the middle of changing, you haven't finished changing, 
and you want the invariant, some invariant, some consistent, some characteristic of the data structure to be maintained. Okay. So um, how 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 should we how should we prevent multiple? How should we ensure atomicity? And those of you who have done operating systems, what kind of mechanisms have you seen in operating systems to uh, ensure atomicity? Uh, you say one arms. Sorry. Uh, you so, okay, let me just, that, that you're coming to the solution. Let me ask the question. So, in your OS, uh, what kind of primitives have you seen? Locking. Locking in, like how, what kind of, what exactly, what? what? Uh, spin locks, for example. So, spin locks is a hardware-based solution. Yeah. Any software-based solution that you've seen also? Are spin locks good, by the way? That's polling, right? And what, what other data structures, what other abstractions have you seen? Semaphores. Semaphores, right? And uh, something else that you might have seen in operating system that's even higher level than semaphores? Monitors, right? Now, so can we use, uh, so, so we were given two solutions, hardware interrupts, disabling hardware interrupts and using spin blocks. Can we use semaphores and uh, monitors to do this, uh, to do this kind of exc mutual exclusion? I mean, interrupts and hard, like the hardware-based solutions. Let's use a proper abstraction. You could, except semaphores are kept where? In the kernel. How do you make sure atomic access to semaphores? Sorry? But I mean, the kernel needs to be, needs mutual exclusion. The kernel implements certain mutual exclusion. The kernel uses mutual exclusion. And we get into a recursion problem. Now we can build some layers at the bottom. That provides semaphores to the layers above. Uh, I'm not familiar with semaphores. Could you give a quick explanation? Uh, you've done operating systems, honors course. You don't know what semaphores are? Porter specifically doesn't like the word and he doesn't use the word. What does he use? Porter. Counting. He attacks. Sorry? He doesn't. He didn't. Yeah, he attacks those units. He attacks those units. He uses mutex. Uh, I don't think he ever used the Okay, think mutex. Yeah. So here's the deal, guys. Um, if you notice, there's an extra credit quiz. Okay. That's all on process coordination. And when you do that quiz, you'll understand all the various mechanisms and the terminology, you know, like semaphores, um, spin locks, and so forth. Okay. So semaphores are just, um, they can allow, they allow, so, so it's, they are counting semaphores and non-counting and non -counting semaphores, and probably he doesn't like non-counting semaphores. Uh, sorry, counting semaphores, but uh, uh, the basically point is that there are some software abstractions from mutual exclusion. They themselves have to keep some data structure, and you have to go and provide mutual exclusion to them. So we have to deal with some lower level abstractions to implement these abstractions in mutual exclusion. Okay, and disabling disabling of uh, uh, the, the test and set instruction. Why would you use test and set instruction that has polling in it? I mean, why would you ever use a polling based solution? Generally, assume it's not the intention, so it's the past. It doesn't affect anything else. Well, you're polling, right? You're just, there's a thread that's polling again and constantly to see whether some, something is free. So that's not a good idea. Yeah. I mean, if you can be certain that it's faster than doing a context switch when you block, then you can do it, but you have to like, know for sure that it's going to be like it's only going to be polling for a little bit so you have to know that it's polling for a little bit yeah you can never be sure of that yeah. so you have to do use polling as a last resort and when is it a last resort you can't use semaphores and other software abstractions andrew somehow said that disabling interrupts is relevant will so when can you not use disabling interrupts so disabling interrupts is relevant to a single processor. When you have multiple processors and you have no other software abstraction, you have to use test and set. And how do you make sure the test and set is not executing too long? You use it to implement only some of us. Okay, hopefully you have control over that. And you can make sure that you know, that gets done quickly. And then the higher level layers can use some of us. So why use test and set? 
You can use some polling instructions. I don't even you know about that, that such an instruction existed, the one you're mentioning. Okay, so it seems longer to say, so I'd prefer something that's shorter to say. Okay, so test and set is something that I would use because it, 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 it seems to do the job. And you have to tell, educate me on why you need, you need something with more adjectives. Okay, on more verbs actually. Okay. okay. Chris, what's your question? Yeah, can you use a toggle semaphore in this situation to prevent like red two being or red one? So you can't use any software abstraction. So uh, you know, uh, I assume this toggle semaphore is what you guys are calling mutex, and you can't use any abstraction that is implemented by the operating system. So you have to use basically when there are multiple processors, you just have to use test and set to reduce contention among them. Okay. Okay. So you can use polling or test and set for multiple processors. You could use the same solution for single processors too. Okay. For threads in a single processor, but we'd rather do something else. Polling is the last resort. So if we had only one processor. How is disabling of interrupts relevant then? I think we kind of answered that question, but, but can you spell it out? Yes, it means that the scheduler is triggered by the time interrupts or at least some interrupt happening. If you never you can't interrupt, you can't have anything to cause the scheduler to be run. Okay, so rescheduling happens to in response to certain events. And some of these events have to do with device I.O. Okay? Or clock interrupting. So we disable these interrupts, those events won't happen. But will rescheduling only happen because of uh, external events? Or can rescheduling happen because of other actions also? Okay. Assuming you're not going to manually yield with the Well, but you can, right? You're going to make a system call. Okay? So you have, to, you have to just stop both things. Okay? So you do not want to call methods that can cause rescheduling to happen. So you don't want to call notify. While you are, you have to, I mean, notification has to be allowed. Just don't call notify while changing a data structure. After you finish in the data structure, you can say notify now. Okay, or reschedule now. But don't do it in the middle of executing a critical section. Yeah, so you have to prevent that. And the way to prevent that is to not call reschedule if we don't have a software abstraction called mutex. Oh, okay. we don't have the I thought that's the whole point here. Okay. So, uh, and then you have to uh, disable receipts of interrupts, interrupts. And by, the, by disabling interrupts, you also prevent cascaded uh, interrupts. Okay, that you have a bunch of interrupts that you can't handle and your stack goes out of bounds. Okay. Questions? Okay, so this is how you would implement a, a, a semaphore, for instance. So while I, I just told you that while interrupts, it, while um, critical section is being accessed, don't call notify. Now while interrupts are disabled, should you be allowed to call wait? No, because, and please raise your hand, guys, because I want to give multiple people chances to answer. Okay, what, because? Because if you make an email, who's going to wake you up? So then you just, you know, you disable interrupts. Who's going to execute? We are not getting any clock interrupts. You haven't called reschedule. So it'll be just blocked. Okay. So, you know, you don't want that to happen. So there are some rules. If you ever write interrupt handlers, you know, device drivers are tricky to write. Okay, most people who've done, people who've done even PhD, so when I first came to UNC, there was this operating system whiz PhD student, whose thesis were all on operating systems. But he was scared of interrupts. Okay, he didn't want to deal with that. Uh, because that is, and, and, and interrupt handlers are difficult to write, and my, the device drivers on my Windows 10 keeps flaking on me, you know, at times it, my mouse won't work. So they're hard to work, right. And, and, um, and there are certain rules you have to follow. And, and the reason we want to get into these rules are because they have to do with 
atomicity scheduling issues, which you have to deal with also in distributed computing. So we, once we understand this at some level, hopefully we'll be more mature in the applications we write. Okay, yeah. I'm still a bit confused about the previous point where you said that you use a test and over test and test and test because a test Sorry, say, say that, say that slowly. You said that you would rather use a test and set over a test, a test and set? I said you would use a test and set. I said you would use a test and set as a last resort. And you went and mentioned some instruction that had more verbs than test and set, which I don't know about. I see. And I said I would rather use a instruction with fewer verbs. No, but uh, so the instruction which I mentioned is basically test and set, but it puts our heads to sleep rather than only when you how can an instruction put threads to sleep when, 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 when the computer hardware doesn't even know what threads are? Okay. There are some GPUs in which kernel, kernel threads are part of the hardware. You can do a lot more. You can implement the whole OS there. Okay. But if you don't know what a thread is, and that's an abstraction provided by the kernel, you can't put any threads to sleep. Okay. Other questions? So there is a notion of a kernel mode. There is a notion of a kernel, kernel stack that is, stored, that is stored in kernel address space. There is a notion that there will be a kernel. What its threads are, are completely defined by the kernel. There's, a, there's an ID kept in, by the kernel that, that is the process context block that is defined by the kernel. And so that is stored. There. But again, I'm telling you that, you know, I've seen talks on GPUs where they actually have threads as part of the architecture. And you can do a lot more. Then. Okay. okay. To answer the question that Andrew was raising last time and somebody else was saying, you know, why am I using two different terms, traps and interrupts? They're the same thing, right? So, why are they, what are the similarity? What are the similarities? Okay, so they both make the thread that's currently executing do something else. They may not stop it. Okay, so uh, uh, have you guys, I'm going to just give you an analogy here, which is going to keep you guys out. Perhaps. But this is how biology works. Have you guys heard of parasitic moths? Have you heard of these parasit parasitic? So tell me, tell me about them. Is this the ones that they uh, burrow and they lay their eggs in dead cadavers or something like that? Like so they are like expert surgeons. They go and pierce the head of a cockroach. I mean, at the right point, where suddenly the cockroach, which was behaving like a cockroach, now behaves like a horse for this particular, I don't know whether it's a paw, moth or what, and it rides it down the hills of Arizona, which is where they're found, and goes to the place where it wants to lay eggs, and, 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 and the, this rider lays the eggs, and the cockroach then protects the eggs and, and, and keeps them warm so that the eggs will hatch, and when they hatch, they eat up the cockroach. Creepy? <laughs> this is how nature, this is how evolution has worked. So, sorry? So, you know, when we think of us humans as being evil with nuclear bombs and all this stuff, you say, wait a minute, you know, what do you think about this guy? <laughs> so, an interrupt handler, here's a thread behaving like a cockroach, and suddenly an interrupt handler gets executed on its, on its stack. Maybe it'll yield to a kernel thread. But the same thread is used in many systems, like this, and it just does different things. And it might actually go and yield access to some higher priority thread, which will now ride the horse or write the CPU, and this thread no longer is executing. And it provided the stack to do so. Okay? So that is how you want to think of as interrupts. Okay? So again, uh, now I, I've forgotten where my, <laughs> what my, where my program counter was before I <laughs> switched to this story. So the traps versus interrupts. What's the similarity? We go and not necessarily execute another thread, but we go and execute a handler. We get hijacked, literally. This is like a hijacking, right? What we're talking about, the hijacker just takes them, takes the car to wherever they want to go. So it gets hijacked in both cases. 
Okay, and what else is the similarity? Both involve change to the kernel mode. Okay, so like interrupts associated with handlers and main memory, which is where you hijack to, cause mode to change from user to kernel restored by special instruction, return from, sorry, return from trap or interrupt instruction. Okay, so that's a similarity. Now, what are the differences? Why do we use two different terms? Yeah, let me get you. Sorry? I think there, there is a, that Okay. So what triggers a trap and what triggers an interrupt is different. Now you can argue that, I mean, if you go down low level enough, I mean, different interrupts have different reasons, right? One might be a keyboard input, one might be a clock interrupt. So somehow what happens in interrupts is different from what happens, but we call them both interrupts. So why don't we call traps also another form of interrupt? What is fundamentally different about a trap? Yeah. This is a guess, but um, a trap is more associated with the process that it's called it, whereas an interrupt can be from practically anywhere. So process, or you, you, did you say process? Yeah. So remember that um, process and threads are not known to the hardware. Sure. But you're almost there. Uh, let me get you. So is a trap like an error and an interrupt is basically like I want to move my mouse. The trap's more severe. So the example of a the example of a trap is error. Example of an interrupt is moving a mouse. Can we abstract out a little bit? Yeah. I'm thinking that normal hardware was software based. So like a trap could be a software based like a system called or something because that's software whereas an interrupt is more sensitive to the hardware. So it's triggered by the software. That's another example that a piece of software will cause a trap instruction. An error is also something that the software did as opposed to Niger. Perhaps something like user-generated interrupts or traps. Something that's generated using user error or something that the user does on the software part. User meaning, I mean, what, who's the user? The end user? The program? I mean, software that he's talking about? I would say, from a kernel point of view, the software is the user. The kernel itself is software also. So I like, I, like, I, I like his answer the best. He had got the prefix of what I wanted. So he used the word process. Can we just expand that a little bit? What, what expand? Lexically, lexically, if you expand process, what do you get? Processor. Okay, can we just look at processor versus something else? Which is kind of your software thing. So event generated by ah, processor versus devices, external devices. So it's an internal event. Here's the CPU executing away. It's and and it just goes and says, let's get, let's transfer control somewhere else because of what I did, not because of some event that happened elsewhere, not because somebody rode my back. It's just this is part of my being a cockroach. Okay, so uh, by the way, there's many examples of this. I listened to a TED talk where this guy is an expert in parasitic worms and he loves it. And, and he just goes and he went and gave examples of many, many examples of this kind. And uh, I mean, there are birds that go and lay eggs in other, other birds' nests because they don't want to be mothers. They, they, they say, hey, somebody else is being a good mother. Let me, you know, let me wait. So... So there's, there's all kinds of ways of exploiting, you know, that human beings haven't even discovered. Okay. So, uh, can we make a response to an internal CPU event? An error such as divide by zero? Or an explicit instruction trap, the system call that you guys were talking about. Okay. And, and uh, so that's fun a difference. In terms of the baggage, the machinery that we have to handle them, what is different between traps and interrupts? I mean, sure, we have handlers in both cases. Aren't they both executed through the same machinery on the CPU? There is some common machinery. What is the machinery that's different? What part of the machinery is different? Interrupt, we, we've seen a lot of machinery. This interrupt handlers, but think of device registers. What kind of information is in device registers?
So what is device register? If I if I if I if I type a character, what gets what happens to my device registers? Ready state, the data. Do we need a ready state in for traps? Do we need interrupt interrupt bit on to say whether you should interrupt or not? Okay. So there's no enabling or disabling of traps. Okay. Because CPU triggers and reacts to the event, and there's no ready bit either. Okay. So you don't have to go. So this, so there's there's some part of the machinery that's different. Stuff and everything all handled by the handler, not the actual. Sure. Sure. But you know, there are just no device registers associated there to change. And the processor state, the processor priority is not looked at when worrying about interrupt handlers. So, yeah, at, at the ultimate level, they're both handlers get executed in both cases. Okay. I think this might be the last slide. And, and you can think of them as really hardware versions of exceptions. Okay, ultimately, exception handlers are called by trap handlers. Okay. No, I, I have many more slides now, I remember. Okay, so CPU in kernel mode has more power than in user mode. And what kind of things can it do in kernel mode that it can't do in user mode? Some examples? Based on what we know already? Many things. It can um, it can change what the handler contains. The handler is called by the hardware. What is stored in the handler, the, the, the address stored in the handler, is is determined by the by the kernel. Yeah. So it has it has some kernel data structures that are not exposed to the user. Other things? Access device addresses. You can't access device addresses directly. Okay. There's a whole list of things. Turn off or turn on off interrupts. Yeah. I was going to say set memory access, which access memory. So set memory access, you mean? Like set on the page table. So it can access page tables. Yeah. Right? So, you know. If you were to sort of define what an operating system is, even those of you who haven't done operating systems, how would you go and define it? It's a piece of software that does what in general? What is its purpose? Yeah. Yeah. It manages uh, different processes. To it creates processes. Firstly, it creates processes. And then does what it manages their meaning? It is the mediator. Okay. They're all going and saying, I want this, I want this, I want the time, I want this memory, I want the CPU. And you said, no, you get it, you get it, you get it. And that's one thing. Yeah. So it provides a higher level abstraction of the shared hardware resources. A compiler will provide you with a high level abstraction of the instructions. An operating system will provide you with a high level abstraction of shared resources. You don't have to deal with the disk. You deal instead with an abstraction defined by the OS files. Okay? So it both beautifies the operating, the, 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 beautifies the uh, hardware, the shared hardware, and it also is a mediator. Okay? So that is why all these things have to be done. Not, not to, you know, you don't allow direct access, you have to go through the mediator. Okay? Um, could you repeat what the kernel was given the higher for the coding of So, somebody else want to answer that question? Uh, it gives a higher level abstraction of what? You just, he's the one who triggered that. It beautifies what? Hardware. The shared hardware is beautified through by some shared abstractions. Sharing is very important because a, a compiler also beautifies the hardware by providing you with better instructions than GoTo. Right? So, are you guys, you guys know about GoTo instructions? 
I come from a generation which actually read papers like go to considered harmful. Okay. Now we don't even expose go to's to you guys. Well, actually in C, can't you go to? And if you've done 411, you know, you had fun with go to's. Sorry? <laughs> Long jumps. <laughs> okay. So now going back to Nirjar's point last time that the cost of transition between user mode and kernel mode. Okay. We saw that the, the, the cost is, you know, much, much more than just making a library call. Okay. And that goes and influences what kind of primitives we provide in the kernel. And IPC primitives are ultimately provided by the kernel. So that, that influences the design of the IPC primitives. Okay, so rather than you having to do two calls to do one thing, we often provide you with one call in the OS to do both things, which may go against modularity, but that just means that we didn't have to switch context twice. Um, when you say context switch, do you mean going from user mode to kernel mode, yes. or do you mean changing the page name design? Um, so there is context switch and there's thread switch. Okay, okay and there's process switch. So now page tables will be ch uh, changed in which kind of switch? Process, process switch, because the address space changes. Okay, so we can think of three different kinds of switches. And and, and the context switch is just associated with going from there going from one mode to the other, okay? And multiple actions done in one system call for efficiency. Okay, this, this is very important. Okay, so we've seen the memory is divided into process address space and kernel address space, okay? And kernel address space consists of interrupt and trap handlers, other kernel data structures such as schedulers and virtual memory manager. Now, I use the word OS and I use the word kernel. Who knows whether they were interchangeable or the same thing? Let's try to figure that part out. So, assuming they're not interchangeable, what's the difference? How would you define the kernel and how would you define the rest of the operating system? Well, so, operating system is everything that is like, like you say, it's a higher abstraction for shared hardware resources. Kernel is a subset of the OS, where it's, uh, where it's at the lowest level of the OS, where it's doing certain stuff, like communicating with threads or scheduling threads or handling context switches or something like that. Okay. So you're saying somehow the OS is layered and some set of bottom layers we go and put in the kernel and some layers above that we go and put in the, in the rest of the operating system. And some of the things you think that those lower layers could be doing is scheduling and that is scheduling. So the interrupt handlers, okay. So given, is there a litmus test? I mean, you know, can I go and say that this software programmatically, can, can I, without having Richard go and examine the code and say, this is what I think is the kernel, this is what thing. Can we all come up with the objective lit litmus test and say, this part of the OS is kernel? Yeah. If it if the instruction executed has to be in ring zero with higher privileges, it's kernel. If it doesn't have to be, then it's operating system. Okay, so th th both your answers are consistent. That the part of code stored in a certain area in memory, perhaps as the kernel, and it has to do with the mode. And you know, the rings are a little bit more complicated than user kernel mode. If I just had user kernel mode, the kernel mode is the piece of code that runs in the kernel mode. What's simpler? Now, what we decide to run there is up to us. Okay. And uh, so, and if you, if it's, if, if some code is not, if some OS code is not part of kernel code, then it runs in user address space. And which means that it runs as part of some process. Okay. So do you want to, I mean, let's just quickly talk about this. Uh, does it make sense? You know, he talked about things that should go into the kernel, the scheduler, the device drivers. Can you think of something that, 
maybe should not go and this is a subjective question yeah file system file system okay and but what do you think in unix and linux is this file system in the kernel outside the kernel so you know how fashion changes i mean there's bot bell bottoms and there's not bell bottoms and and living long enough you know it's amazing every time i see a new os talk i'm taken to something i studied in my history books of things that happened earlier so things keep changing and uh, people tried the file system out to put it outside the thing and then they put it back and what is the reason to put it back in faster, faster because You switch much more between user and kernel mode. Okay. So uh, that is not to say that there are not modern operating systems where this is out. One of the first operating systems that did this was a system called Mark from CMU, and Apple adopted that variation of that system. So I won't be surprised if an Apple, uh, but Apple's gone back to Linux, right? So yeah. So man, you know, but can you think of something that you think of as OS functionality that is outside the OS? So is the Windows Manager part of the uh, part of the OS? What do you guys think? Is the shell part of the OS? OS. OS, you know, we, we talk of so so in good old multics, the shell was part of the kernel. And among many innovations Unix took, they put a shell outside. And what happened as a result? You could change the shell with your own shell. And how many variations of shell exist? Of course, you guys all use Bash, I'm sure. I grew up with C shell. And before me was shell. And 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 so so flexibility does count. Okay. And and so anyway, we are, we're not going getting into too much of the OS design issues here. Uh, but the question is: with the kernel, I communicate to system calls which means executing traps. How do I communicate with the files manager that's outside the kernel? Go into the kernel using what primitives? What? Now remember, yeah, sure, sure, but at, at a higher level, remember what is not inside the kernel is in a process. So how do you communicate with the, with, with the uh, part of the uh, OS that is not in the kernel? IPC. So when you said certain parts of the operating system must be in the kernel, processes must be in the kernel because otherwise how could you have an OS process that handles file systems? IPC must be in the kernel. And, and if you've got processes in the kernel, then scheduling also is in the kernel. Though you may have higher level schedulers above. And IPC must also, at least some form of IPC must be in the kernel. Okay. So that's how I'm tying this to, again, our course, which is all about IPC. Okay, questions? Then you can tap it to go to access the IPC. Yeah. But so, the so, what I have to do is what he said. I have to call this, make a send call. Send call will go in, trap. That will go and put some data in a system buffer. And the, the or file system will make a receive call, which will get the data. So, ultimately, we are communicating through traps and handlers, but we are hand Communicating via IPC mechanisms. So just an abstraction above those calls. Okay? And often the same IPC mechanism that we use to communicate with the OS processes, we will also use to communicate with distributed processes. Okay? And, and by the way, this means that this is the biggest reason why people have been trying to do this. That the part of the OS that's not in the kernel can be accessed by a remote computer. Rather than using local send receive, they can use remote send and receive. So distrib distributing it becomes an attractive thing. And what happens in today is that the local file system is handled by the kernel, but the distribution aspects, NFS, AFS, there are servers on top that do that, which rely on the lower level operating file system in the kernel. Okay, but you, they could be implementing the whole thing. Okay. Would it be faster to break in the distributed aspect into the kernel? 
So what does that mean? So all these algorithms are different distributed consensus or distributed systems. There's so many algorithms which can be run on like different things. I don't know how exactly to phrase this, but these things which exist beyond the OS mode in the user mode, for example, like they'll be coding stuff in Java uh, for this program. Can these exist inside the kernel to make stuff faster? Why not? make distributed systems part of the operating system itself. And what's the, what, so why not put everything that we can in the kernel and what's the drawback? Security, the drawback. So, security for one. Security for one. You might slow down your system. And he, what did he say? All these algorithms? So that means there's some choice to be made? So the kernels, every time you have a new algorithm, go and get Mr. Linux inventor to go and change the code? Okay, I forget his name. So, uh, rather than you writing your own little shell. So, this was the argument that Multics had. Okay, so it's a trade-off. And we don't know how much communication is going back and forth to the kernel. Maybe you just got to make one kernel call for, you know, 150 operations. We can afford that. Okay. So, is that why having a, to try to make just one system is probably easier to do, like, a program, an application above the OS level then, rather than trying to make the OS itself a distributed system. Okay, so the distributed programs you write may or may not provide OS functionality, right? It might be this your assignment. And there are countless distributed programs. So you don't want to put them all in the kernel, obviously. The question becomes how much of the distributed fun uh, distribution functionality you want to put inside the kernel. And, uh, you know, you can go and put a files, file system in the kernel where it has most of the data structures. You still need a way for a remote client to go and access that functionality in the kernel. That has to be done through IPC. And all we can have is a very thin NFS layer or a thin AFS layer with bulk of the work being done in the kernel. Or we can just say we'll put more of it outside. And we know that there's more than one way to do a file system. We can have AFS or NFS. So that's a fantastic example of why you want to put it outside the kernel and not make a decision. On the other hand, people used to also think that we'll have more than one way to do file system, local file system. But the Unix file system, which is 60 years old, is here to stay. Okay, so why not? So we don't lose much in flexibility by putting it. Okay. Okay, I think I'm.